Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I2M Georgetown. I'm Amanda Kane. Um, I am the previous co-director of the Learning Societies and um, M4 at Georgetown Medical School. And I am Sydney Polka. I am the former director of the Learning Societies and a fourth year here at Georgetown. And um, we just want to start by thanking everyone for coming. First and foremost, I know that you know everyone here is busy. Um, either you're headed to medical school, you're in medical school, or you finish medical school and realize how much busier life gets after that. Um, and so we really appreciate you taking the time and reflecting with us and, and really trying to identify what is important here. So um, we appreciate that. We just want to thank also the people that have planned this and um, the people that have volunteered as facilitators and volunteers, um, learning societies. You know, we can speak for them, but we're very, very proud to have collaborated with Gold Humanism Honor Society and Jack Penner um, and, <laughs> and also uh, the Office of Student Affairs, which has been a huge help and always is a huge help in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion who puts on great events like this all the time. So thank you to all of those people. So this is the second year of this very important event. Uh, the origin of the event was that students felt the desire that we need to create a space to explore how our identities, our backgrounds, and our experiences uh, affected ourselves and how we're perceived by others. Uh, affect how we navigate this institution, affect how we navigate the field of medicine, and also how comfortable we are to claim Georgetown as our own. Um, and so this is why we felt that it was very important to continue this event into this year and hopefully into many years to come. So tonight, it, our topic is, and our theme, is finding meaning in medicine. And so we're hoping to kind of delve into what really medicine means to us and all of its different parts um, and have these really deep conversations and more ask questions rather than make assumptions and learn from each other and learn about each other and become closer as a community. Um, and really, what we're also trying to um, really kind of just show here is how much Georgetown values identity, because there's everybody comes from different backgrounds, um, and everybody has their story, and it's so important. So you guys bringing that perspective to the table tonight is huge, and we really appreciate it. So thank you all again for coming. Um, now we're going to bring up Jack Penner, and he's going to introduce our speaker. So our speaker this evening is Dr. Dhruv Kalar. Uh, Dhruv is a physician at Cornell as well as a health policy researcher there. He is a contributor at the New York Times where he explores the intersection of medicine, health, policy, and economics. He recently worked on the ABC News Medical Unit, helping to curate and communicate evolving health stories and was previously at the White House Office of Management and Budget, focusing on Affordable Care Act implementation. Uh, he completed his training in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital, affiliated with Harvard Medical School. He got his MD from Yale School of Medicine, as well as a Master's of Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School, where he was a fellow at the Center for Public Leadership. His work has appeared in academic journals, such as the New, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, as well as lay publications, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The Atlantic, and Slate. Uh, he was recognized by LinkedIn as one of the top 10 healthcare professionals under 35 years old and the National Minority Quality Forum as a 40 under 40 leader in health. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Drew Klar. Thank you guys for having me here today. Um, so it is uh, uh, really great to have the opportunity to be with you all at uh, this important event, and more importantly, at this uh, important conversation. And I'd like to start by talking a little bit about my uh, favorite medical diagnosis, which is failure to thrive. And I don't like it because patients are failing to thrive. That part, I think, is quite sad. And I don't like it because it's easy to treat, because it's not easy to treat. I like it because the diagnosis carries with it kind of a bold proposition. And that is that humans in their natural state aren't just meant to survive, they're meant to thrive. Now, what it means to thrive for each of us could be very different. It's different for medical students and residents. It's different for 
doctors and for patients. It's different for parents and their children. But what I think is at the heart of thriving, of flourishing, of having peace, of having contentment, is having a sense of purpose, having a sense of meaning in the work that we do and in our daily lives. And that sense of purpose can come, I think, from sometimes small and very unexpected places. And so I admitted a middle-aged man a few uh, months ago. He had metastatic cancer that was widely metastatic. He'd lost a quarter of his body mass over the past year, and his eye sockets uh, cratered, his, his temples had sunk in. And the night I admitted him, he told me, you know, Doc, a year ago, I wouldn't have cared uh, if, if I lived. I would have said, take me, God. What good am I doing here anyway? But now you have to save me because Sadie needs me. He told me about how he had struggled with depression most of his adult life. And strangely enough, it seemed to him, he was most at peace when he was caring for his mother, who had Parkinson's. But she had passed away a few years ago, and he felt aimless and without a sense of purpose. And that's when Sadie wandered into his life. And Sadie was his cat. And so finding purpose beyond oneself uh, has long been understood to be crucial for what it means to live a good life. And John Stuart Mill wrote that only those are happy who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness, on the happiness of others, on the improvement of mankind. Aiming thus at something else, he writes, they find happiness by the way. Viktor Frankl cared for prisoners in the Nazi concentration camps. And he believed that people could find meaning even in the midst of unimaginable suffering. He wrote, it was a question of getting people to realize that life was still expecting something of them. In medicine, we're lucky. Our work is almost by definition infused with meaning and with purpose. We're devoted uh, to using our skills and our knowledge to reducing the suffering of others. We enter our patients' lives at moments of fear and uncertainty and trauma, and we do our best to help them through those experiences. I wonder why, then, it's so hard to keep that in mind. Why is it that so many of us struggle with depression and apathy and cynicism? What makes maintaining purpose and meaning so difficult uh, in the field in which we practice? So some recent surveys suggest that the majority of physicians would not recommend that their children enter medicine. More than half of doctors experience symptoms of burnout. A third of residents experience depression. 10% of medical students report that they've had suicidal thoughts in the last few months. And we know that every year, as we progress in our medical training, we become less and less empathic. So what is behind this? Well, I think on deeper inspection, it's not so surprising that we have these problems. There are reasons that we find ourselves in the position uh, in which we find ourselves. And some of those reasons have to do with the sheer number of hours that we work in the hospital. The days can be long, the nights are even longer, and the rigors of medical training, I think, sometimes make it hard to stay in touch with family, make it hard to stay in touch with friends, make it hard to stay in touch with ourselves. I think this is particularly true when the sheen of our medical school essays starts to wear off, and the burden of administrative tasks start to build up. When we're spending less time with patients and more time entering orders or writing discharge summaries 
or faxing medical records or doing a host of non-clinical tasks. Other problems have not to do with administrative tasks, but with how we treat one another as colleagues. So too often we're treating other members of our medical team, other members of other uh, medical specialties with disrespect. And more than a third of doctors say that they have re experienced rude or dismissive or aggressive behavior multiple times in the past week. And not surprisingly, the more junior you are on the medical team, the more likely you are to have experienced disrespect. And a third set of factors has to do with something that's inherent to our work. Uh, medicine is, I think, an inherently intense profession. It's an emotional profession. It's a physically demanding profession. We wake up, we go to work, we perform CPR on someone, we have impossible conversations with patients, we tell uh, the parents of a, a child that they're not going to get the heart transplant or the liver transplant that they need to live. And the next day we wake up and, and we do it again. And those types of things, they're not an unintended consequence. They're not an unwanted consequence of practicing medicine. That's just the job. And so I think we need to take time to reflect on those types of things. And so what, what can we do? What can be done to uh, make meaning and purpose central to the work that we do, do uh, every day? I think that one solution that uh, we might assume would be an easy fix is to have uh, more humane uh, duty hours. And so the iCompare trial that was published a few weeks ago suggests that residents who work longer shifts, who don't have mandatory time off between, between shifts, they tend to be more dissatisfied with their educational experience. They tend to have a lower overall sense of well-being. But I think more important than the quantity of hours that we're working in the hospital is the quality of time that we spend in the hospital. And so many of us, I think, would gladly spend twice as long at the patient's bedside if we could spend half as long at a computer. And many medical educators, I think, rightly worry that medical students and that residents aren't getting enough clinical experience, don't see enough cases, but at the same time, we allow residents to make follow-up appointments, to fax discharge summaries, to spend their time doing a host of other non-clinical activities. And so if we are serious about improving the quality of medical education, we need to start by making sure that the time that people spend in the hospital is spent on direct patient care and with other uh, important medical and clinical opportunities. I think that here technology can be helpful and it can help not just medical trainees but also doctors at all levels of training. So we hear so much these days about uh, how artificial intelligence and new medical technologies are going to replace doctors. But I think a better question is how can we help design and incorporate these technologies into the work that we do to make room for the work that we want to do. So a big contribution of tech might not be making medical care more efficient or making medical care more convenient. It might actually be crystallizing what only we as humans, as doctors, can offer. Those are things like compassionate care and clinical intuition and critical thinking and helping patients make the decisions that are right for them. So we shouldn't think of technology as replacing what we do, but rather as making room, I think, for what only we can do. So one goal is to do everything that we can to reduce administrative burden, to do everything we can to increase quality time with patients. And I think a second goal should be creating the time and the opportunity for reflection. And that is why events like this are so important. 
Because I think in so many ways, we all already know and we already feel all the things that I'm talking about. Uh, we know that our work has meaning, and that's why we chose this profession. The trick is keeping that belief at the forefront of our consciousness, that making that we have to make that decision actively every day to recognize that it is a privilege to do the work that we do. And so uh, in his essay, This is Water, by David Foster Wallace, he says that our default position is to think in an automatic, unconscious way, and that it takes work to consciously decide what you're going to decide has meaning and what doesn't have meaning. So he writes, the only thing that is capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to see it. And so we as a medical community, we need to make time for that kind of reflection. And that can take many different forms. It can be sponsored by medical schools. It can be sponsored by residency programs. We can have uh, mindful meditation and narrative medicine. Uh, we can have other wellness programs. But it can also be much more informal. And so during my most difficult months of medical school, I met every Sunday with three of my best friends. And we would dim the lights, we would turn off our phones, we would open up a bottle of wine. Uh, it was a lot less romantic and a lot more uh, <laughs> collegial than I'm making it sound. But we, we shared uh, the most challenging and the most rewarding moments of the past week. And I think having those conversations allowed each of us to glean, uh, if not create, meaning in the most challenging and the most traumatic experiences. Things like uh, a child that you cared for passing away, or the abusive language uh, of a superior, or the guilt of committing uh, a medical error. And so it was in those types of sessions that I chose what specialty. I wanted to go in. I chose that I wanted to go to uh, public policy school. I made the decision to reconnect with friends that I had lost touch with. And that type of reflection, I think, is critical to maintaining or even making meaning and finding purpose in our work and in our lives. So the first goal should be to make room for quality work within the hospital. The second goal should be to make room for reflection outside of the hospital. And a third goal, I think, is creating a positive narrative, both within the medical community and for uh, society at large, about what it means to be a medical professional. So when we put on a white coat, what promises are we making to patients and what promises are we making to the public? And today's physicians were trained in an environment in which words like provider and consumer are used as frequently as healer and patient. We're trained in an environment in which discussions of cost and incentives are as frequent as discussions of trust and duty and humanism. And so in the midst of that type of evolution, I think we need to think about and reflect on what type of narrative we need to maintain pride in the work that we do. And that's a narrative that needs to be discussed constantly. It needs to be discussed at noon conference and at professional society meetings. It needs to be discussed uh, on Twitter and in op-eds and on Capitol Hill. And it's a narrative about the promises that we make when we enter this profession. And the first promise is that I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this job. It's a promise of competence. It's a promise of excellence. Uh, and it means being more concerned with doing good and with being good than it is with looking good. And the second promise is that I have your best interest at heart. I have the patient's best interest in mind and that we are here to serve them. And I think that requires taking a few moments like we are now to meditate on the privilege of taking care of others. But I think 
The current environment makes it so that there's now a third part of this professionalism, and that has to do with bringing our experiences and the experiences of our patients into the public discourse. Because whether we like it or not, doctors now operate in a healthcare system that is equal parts medicine and politics and economics. And the current social environment makes it hard not to feel like our responsibilities extend beyond the clinic and beyond the hospital. And that's in part, I think, because as medical professionals, we now represent an increasingly rare link in an increasingly unequal society. And so doctors are among the most well-paid, well-educated, well-connected professionals. But we're also intimately familiar with some of the most vulnerable and marginalized populations. We have a unique perspective into what disadvantaged populations are going through on the ground. And that's not the case for all professionals. It's not the case that CEOs or management consultants or iBankers are examining the feet of diabetic patients or that they're interviewing people who are struggling with opioid addiction. But we do that every day. That's part of our job. And so uh, if for no other reason, I think we need to speak up and we need to speak out to give voice to those people who can't give voice to themselves. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, it's been such a great honor to be part of this conversation with you all. And I hope to continue this conversation with you in the future. Thank you.